This video is brought to you by Mubi. Go to Mubi.com slash Thomas Flight for your extended 30-day free trial. And for me, interested in and knowledgeable about my girlfriend's work. Wait for Jake. How's the paper going? Oh, it's nowhere actually. I really do need to get back tonight. Deal with it first thing. I'll get you home. Chains. Chains. As you watch, I'm thinking of ending things. You might start to think that the world the film inhabits feels a bit off. Of course, if you've seen any of writer and director Charlie Kaufman's films before, you were probably expecting this. But even before anything really strange happens, while it's just two characters riding in a car, having a fairly normal conversation, things feel weird. In a film, any sense we have of its mood and its environment is produced by the filmmaking, one of the most powerful of those techniques working almost invisibly to help create, I'm thinking of ending things, a strange, unsettling atmosphere is the editing. In much of the first half of the car ride, the tension and awkwardness is driven by the performances. The editing deliberately flowing with the rhythm of the conversation. She hasn't been well. What's going on with her? Just saying, if you want to stop for a snack or anything like that, it would probably be fine. Um, in terms of appetite spoiling, and it might even be advisable. <laughs> I'm fine. Okay. Editing in a conversation like this often mimics the flow of attention in a real life conversation. If you imagine yourself sitting between the characters, looking back and forth, there's a slight lag between when someone speaks and when your attention can shift to them. What's going on with her? Just saying, if you want to stop for a snack or... If someone interrupts the speaker, it will take a small beat for you to shift your attention to the other speaker. Child being father of the you, man and all. Are you a fan of Wordsworth then? And then when a speaker seems to have reached their conclusion, you might expectantly shift your attention to the other person waiting for a response. They do it every few years for obvious reasons. I mean, who does it every few years? Editors mimic this type of flow of attention in a conversation to help their cut feel natural and invisible. Of course, editors aren't bound by these rules. Sometimes editors will defy the natural rhythm of a conversation in order to place specific emphasis on a character's perspective or reaction. And sometimes they might adopt a different pace to maintain the overall aesthetic or pacing of the film if it calls for longer or shorter takes. But you could also defy this natural rhythm editing instead in a slightly off-kilter rhythm, using cuts that are asynchronous to the conversation to create an uncomfortable, unsettling feeling or to illustrate the disconnect between two characters in a conversation. A great example of this in the film is the moment in the car ride right after they pass the swing set. That's odd. Did you see that swing set we just passed? What swing set? It was weird. It was this beautiful new swing set in front of an abandoned house. No, I missed that. Where? I didn't see it. Why would that be there? I mean, clearly no one has lived in that house for years. Someone's moving in and they brought the swing set first. That's all I can think of. I that's, that seems like an unlikely sequence of events. Here, the editing, in a sense, loses its rhythm. Cuts happen just a little bit too early or too late. Instead of following the natural rhythm of attention I just talked about, it's in effect almost as if the editor momentarily loses focus. Here, it cuts to Jake way too early. Did you see that swing set we just passed? What swing set? It's weird. And again, here, it cuts too late to catch his line. A new swing set in front of an abandoned house. No. Here, we linger on Jake past where it feels like we should cut back to the young woman. That's, that seems like an unlikely sequence of events. But when we do finally cut back to her, her line is over. An unlikely sequence of events. Any of these little things by themselves would probably not be noticeable, but when they're all used together in such close proximity, you can feel the effect as you watch it. The trick here is that the off-kilter nature of the edit is dramatic enough that you notice the effect, but not so bad that it registers as bad editing for the audience. You want the audience to notice the effect, not the cause of the effect. It's similar to the balance that has to be struck in the film's cinematography. Here you want the composition to feel cramped. You want to push things beyond what would normally be a comfortable composition. But you still don't want to create 
bad cinematography. You want the audience to feel cramped and be thinking about the story, not thinking about the cinematography as bad. Later in the film, editing is used in a more obvious way. In the barn, characters seem to jump and move in time without any deliberate transition shots. There you have it, the sheep. What will happen to the lambs? What? What will happen to I don't know what them? you're asking me. They're already dead, so what else? Obviously, jumps in time happen all the time in between scenes in films or even in scenes with montages, but to have deliberate skips in time without any noticeable transition shots or shots that give the effect of time passing makes the scene feel off kilter. Come on, I'll show you the, the old pen where we used to keep the pigs. They had to put them down. It's too bad. Rotten situation. Again, while it's more noticeable here, the difference between what constitutes comfortable and uncomfortable is subtle. Look at how different the jump in time feels if we add just a short transitionary shot. There you have it. The sheep. What will happen to the lambs? What? What will happen to I don't know what them? you're asking me. They're already dead, so... Just adding those two seconds of footage gives us a sense of time passing. And so when we cut back to the characters and they've moved, it doesn't feel abrupt or abrasive. Again, this is what you would normally want to do to make your editing feel invisible and make the audience comfortable. But Kaufman and his editor are subverting the correct way to edit to deliberately create an uncomfortable effect. Shifts in time like this are used periodically throughout the rest of the film. In this scene, the characters seem to shift from interacting with a dog that doesn't seem to be in the room to looking at a photo of the dog. You're a stinky, wet monster, huh? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. About? His smell. Jake, he's a dog. It's fine. Jimmy. Here, the shot of the photo could work as a transition shot, but it's cut far too short for the transition to really feel natural. Watch how different it feels if you just extend the length of the shot of the photo a little bit. His smell? Jake, he's a dog. It's fine. Jimmy. These incongruities in editing, along with the many other ways the film breaks rules of continuity in costume or character details, shifts in time in the story, or even randomly cutting lines of dialogue out of the sound mix, all work together to create the film's overall uneasy and unsettling atmosphere. One of the things that makes editing such a difficult craft to master is that the difference between uncomfortable and perfect timing can be very subtle. And there's no formula you can memorize that will tell you exactly when to time a cut or how long a transition shot should be to feel natural. And even if there was a formula, that formula wouldn't tell you when to break the rules like Kaufman and his editor are doing here. Creating these kinds of effects involves having an intuition for that rhythm and then knowing how to subvert that intuition without drawing attention to the subversion. And these things are difficult to teach. I can make videos breaking down what other people have done, but the only way to really develop that sense is by watching a ton of well-edited material and through practice by editing material yourself. Thank you to Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is an online streaming platform with a heavy focus on curation. You can go to mubi.com slash Thomas Flight for your extended 30 day free trial where you'll be able to watch anything in Mubi's library. Recently, I found on Mubi this documentary called Obit. It's about New York Times obituary writers. And I know this movie is probably not everyone's type of thing, but I love it. And it's the kind of thing I never would have found if it weren't for Mubi. You can watch Obit right now on their library and if that's not your thing they add a new film to the collection every day they add art house films independent films classic films and new festival favorites you can check it all out right now at movie.com slash thomas flight sign up to get your extended 30-day free trial and check out the films they have available Thank you for watching this video. Special thank you to my patrons. Right now for my $5 patrons, I'm doing a thing where I let them pick a movie for me to watch and then I make a video reviewing that movie. So if you want to get in on that or you want to learn about the other rewards that are available to people who support my channel, you can go to patreon.com slash thomasflight.
I suppose I watched too many movies. <laughs>